Awesome. All right, dear ones. Well, good morning, everybody. Once again, um, I wanted to just kind of start out to see if anybody has any comments or questions or anything um, about what we've done so far. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes. Was that who was giggling? Sally, that sounded like you. That's your giggle, isn't it? Excuse me. Yes. It's improving. It, my intent to meditate is improving. Nice. Nice. Hooray. Um I wanted to reflect on last week's session which as we all know, got a little uh, hijacked for a moment. I got such lovely notes from so many of you <laughs> about that incident. And I reflected on it a lot. And I think it might have been uh, Joanne's note that was so beautiful. And she likened it to meditation. You know, here we are, we're quiet, we're paying attention to the breath, we're, or whatever the anchor we're going to use. And then suddenly, you know, something pops up that needs, is wanting our attention. Ah, so we turn towards it, we acknowledge it, we handle it with uh, a kindness and a tenderness, and then we return to our anchor. So it was like Miles was the thing that popped up. I needed attention right then. And so you deal with it in a kind and loving way. You know, I didn't yell at him for how dare you burst in here and, you know, it's the same um, idea that we want to treat ourselves with that same kindness. Ah, okay. This, you know, you've been hijacked here. I see you. Let me just very gently lead you back to some place where you can uh, relax and be okay. And then I can turn my attention back to what I was doing. And I thought it was really kind of a nice little miniature um, analogy for a practice. So I just thought that was kind of fun. Um, I wanted to mention that. So anyway, with that being said, um, today we are turning our attention towards the third um, foundation of mindfulness, which is mindfulness of thought. So a great uh, meditation uh, master was once asked um, how the modern world appeared to him from his forest monastery, and he responded, lost in thought. Lost in thought. So what does it mean to be mindful? of your thoughts. Well, of course, to be mindful of something, we have to step outside of ourselves. And our usual way, as we've talked, is to be caught up in the content of the thought, the emotion, the drama of whatever the thoughts may be. So we're on this repetitive wheel of judgments and opinions and commentary about ourselves and about others. And the thing is, we have a very strong tendency to believe everything that we think. We have this tendency to believe our thoughts and we can spend years of our life being very loyal to a thought that may be misguided. As the Dalai Lama likes to say, I think I mentioned this before, some of your thoughts do not have your best interest at heart. And then there's also that great uh, bumper sticker that always said, uh, don't believe everything you think. <laughs> Surely we all have an awareness of the endless chatter of our monkey minds, our narrative mind loves to tell a story. Our repetitive mind loves to just keep repeating that story over and over and over and over again. And then our wanting mind is on a continual search for the next thing, right, that's going to bring us happiness or going to relieve our suffering. 
So there's this constant flow, this constant exchange of thought and energy that's going on. And as we become more familiar with the landscape of our minds, and we see these thoughts as they appear, we can even start to kind of uh, notice that we have a, a top 10, right? Our hit tunes, the top 10 that we like to uh, use a lot. So as I, you know, watch my thoughts go by, I can see, oh, there's number one, there's, you know, worrying about my son. Okay, number two, how am I going to pay for the dental work that I need to have done? Uh, number three, you know, that political issue that I'm worried about. So the same things keep popping up, popping up, popping up. So it's an interesting <laughs> exercise to see if you can notice your own top 10. And then once again, as we're learning, it pops up, you can go, oh, look, there's number one. I see you number one. I'm okay for now and return to whatever we're doing. So it's just another kind of opportunity for us to observe how we uh, relate in the world. And the more that we can turn our attention towards these thoughts, rather than trying to turn away from them, um, we start to see that they can dissipate because it's like when we turn our attention towards them, it's like putting sunlight on a cloud. You know, it, it just evaporates. So this is the practice. We notice that the thoughts appear and that they disappear, that they come and they go. And so we can start to make that shift from being wrapped up inside of the thought to stepping back and merely watching them as they parade by. You know, they're always making a beautiful show for us. So it's like we're sitting by the side of the road and we can watch all the car thoughts go by and go by. And we just observe them. You know, we're not, um, we don't wanna jump into the middle of traffic because that's gonna cause a real problem. So if we can just sit back, relax back, and watch them as they go by. This is part of the practice for the mindfulness of thoughts. So the point is not to stop the traffic, right? Not to stop the thoughts, but to just see them, to see them clearly and skillfully. I mean, after all, part uh, thoughts are part of our evolution. They've kept us safe. They've taught us how to survive. And oftentimes that is very helpful, but then sometimes the thoughts are not so helpful. In fact, they are misguided and, you know, to use today's terms like fake news. We're giving ourselves fake news a lot. So we can learn to wake up to that and to see clearly. So with consciousness or loving awareness, as we call it as well, we become the one who observes the workings of the mind, simply the observer. And this is a revolutionary shift for most of us. Because we there's just so much going on inside and we have identified with it for most of our lives. So it takes a real shift to step back and not be so identified with the thoughts that are going on through our mind. They can serve us in wonderful ways, but they can also constrict us and imprison us sometimes. There's a story about, um, and I'm sure this is, you know, I'm kind of remembering it in a fog, but I think it's a great example. There was a tiger in a zoo, right? And the tiger, this is in, back in the day, and they're in, he's in a cage. And so he's just pacing back and forth. And this is the only life he's ever known, the only environment he's ever known. So for however many years he's paced back and forth, that's all he knows. So then they build a new tiger environment with a, you know, beautiful, lots of space and water features and, you know, the whole shebang. They bring him to the new environment. They release him into it. And of course, what does he do? He paces 
back and forth in that same eight foot or however big his cage was. So this is a good example of kind of what we do. We get an idea about something, we condition ourselves about it, and then we're caught, we're caught in it. No matter if we're in this huge environment, we still see only this little space. So this is the challenge, right? This is the invitation, is to be able to kind of sit back and skillfully see exactly what's going on without all of our own um, opinions put onto it. We all have thoughts, we have judging thoughts and planning thoughts and anxious and loving thoughts, all, all of this is going on inside. So we want to learn to hold them lightly. The point isn't to get rid of them, like I've said, but to just see them for what they are. They're not going to go away, but we see them. And so we can learn to say, oh, hmm, isn't that interesting, that thought? Ah, oh, there's a new perspective or, oh, I've seen you before. And so we can handle our thoughts in this way. But becoming the observer, of course, requires that switch in perspective. So as the observer, we can start to understand and see this ever flowing, coming and going of thought. It's a thought stream that is continually running through our minds. And the observer just watches as we go through all these gyrations. I, not so long ago, was at a birthday party for a friend and we went to an escape room. And if you've ever done an escape room, it's, it's <laughs> first of all, it's a lot of fun. But you know the concept, you know, you have to get out of these rooms, you're given a few clues, and you need to find your way from one place to the next to the next. Well, there it was a rather large group of us. And so I kind of decided to take the position of the observer. And I sat back as I watched everyone reading the clues and running from one thing, getting super excited when they solved something, getting really frustrated and, you know, a little angry when they didn't. And there's a time thing and just watching all of the drama unfold of this escape room and just sitting back and just watching my friends. And I thought, wow, this is like watching my brain, watching my mind. Oh my gosh, this is very exciting. Oh, this pisses me off. Oh, this is nice. And I could look at it all without getting wrapped up in it, just observing it and actually with a light touch and a bit of humor, which is always, always necessary. So that kind of reminded me of this idea of becoming the observer as well. So the important thing, I think I've hammered this home, is to remember in working with thoughts to not get caught up in the emotion of it of all of the drama of it. Uh, thoughts happen all by themselves, right? So there's no need to take thinking personally, as crazy as that may sound. It's just what minds do. You know, our minds secrete thoughts like our mouths secrete saliva. That's another great one. So it becomes a bit of a revelation that we don't have to believe our thoughts. And we can even start to see that thoughts really aren't that real, right? They come, they exist for a time, and then they pass away. And then there comes the space of where we see the process of thinking arising and passing. And then we can begin to even shift the attention to becoming the awareness itself to that loving awareness, the knowing itself, the one who knows. So the teaching is that who you are is a consciousness that's been born into this body. And as we can shift from the content of the thought to observing the thought, to becoming the awareness itself, you know, that's 
the liberation. And these are all different levels of letting go. You know, this is not an easy process. So as you do, you just, we start to quiet. We start to see a little bit more clearly. And then the heart can become uh, a place where you live from and not just the mind. The two can come together for real wisdom. So there's a, a saying, I think it's from the Bhagavad Gita. It says, uh, who is your greatest enemy? The mind untrained is your greatest enemy. Who is your greatest friend? The mind well-trained is your greatest friend. All right, my dears. So let's do a little bit of practice together, shall we? Is it okay to get on the floor? You sure. Need, you don't you need want to be on the floor. You can be in a chair. You can lie down. You can be wherever it is comfortable. So assume your position. And I'll ring the bell to begin. And I'll also ring the bell as we end. Okay. So here we go. Taking a posture that allows you to be comfortable and relatively still, where you can be alert and at ease. Feel the connection of the earth supporting you through the floor, through the chair, through your cushion. As well as gravity, keeping you in place so that you're held. And if you haven't already, taking a few deeper, fuller breaths. And with the exhale, letting go. You may even softly say to yourself, I am arriving. I am home. And then letting the breath find its own natural rhythm. And just letting the breath breathe you. Settling in. And now begin to notice where you can feel the breath the easiest. Perhaps in the rise and fall of the belly. or the chest, 
a tingling or a swirling in the back of the throat, or even the air as it is drawn in and released from the nostrils. And let your attention lightly rest there. And as always, when the attention is drawn away, when you wake up, just very gently bringing the attention back to the breath, observing the breath with a sense of kindness and friendliness towards yourself. And now taking just a few moments for a brief body scan to allow any parts of the body that are still holding on to tension to let go, to soften. And starting with the head, just bringing the attention to the crown of the head. And gently scanning down the body, checking in, not trying to change anything, just seeing how things are. Scanning down all the way, really letting your awareness touch all the parts of the body, all the way down to the tips of the toes. Releasing any tension, any gripping. And now feeling into the contact points of your body and whatever support system you may be on. So the feet with the floor. How are the feet resting on the floor? The legs onto the chair or onto each other. The hands onto the legs, just the contact points. Bring a little attention to each of those points, just being curious. And now holding the entire body in your awareness. And bringing your attention back to the simple fact that you're sitting and breathing. And that it's important to do this with patience and kindness and the intention to start again.
because each time that you notice the mind has wandered, you're strengthening your ability to be in the present and developing a wise and skillful relationship with the mind. And now from, <clears throat> from this embodied place, begin to softly name the experience of thinking with a gentle, non-judging tone. Simply knowing that the process of thinking is happening. No need to get lost in the content. No need to get caught up in the story. And when we do this, we're not feeding those thoughts. And they can often dissolve on their own. So we don't try to get rid of them. We don't try to even figure out why a thought has come up or be concerned about how long it's here. Just simply as soon as you become aware we return to the breath. And you may begin to notice different themes or repetitive patterns of thought, like planning, remembering, worrying or wanting. So try naming them in that very kind, non-judgmental way. You know, whatever is here. And if it's not clear to you, you know, it's not important. Don't struggle to find the right word. Just call it thinking. And each time you become aware of thinking and can return to the present with patience and kindness, that is a liberating moment of mindfulness. So we allow the thoughts to rise and fall like the breath. Thoughts have no form. Like clouds, they float by and float away. They become lighter, losing form until that cloud, that thought, has disappeared. And just the vast and boundless sky 
remains. These words from Zen master Thich Nhat Hanh. Thoughts and feelings come and go like clouds in a windy sky. Conscious breathing is my anchor. Thoughts and feelings come and go like clouds in a windy sky. Conscious breathing is my anchor. And then for this last minute, just simply rest in the open, spacious, loving field of awareness that you are. All right, dear ones. So, thoughts, comments, how did it go? All is allowed, complaints as well as whatever. Good. <laughs> Okay, good. Well, I have to say that your t discussion on Miles last week is my dog was visiting me, looking at me. I was waiting for the bark and finally he led me to the bedroom and I went, no, not now. <laughs> but he stayed there. <laughs> so well, all your thing about Miles last week, I went all over with the dog. <laughs> Practice, practice, practice. Practice, practice. <laughs> I kept thinking, I kept thinking I was hearing our dogs. And I'm like, are they okay? And then, okay, it's a thought. No, it's probably Miles. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was your dog. <laughs> I kept hearing a dog and I was like, they're fine. Well, it's good practice. It is. A it's dog or a little... kid, I'm not sure which one. Um, well, 
it, it could very possibly have been um, Miles because of course I cannot mute myself and there is activity in, in our house. So, yeah. Well, I just had to intuitively check in with our dogs like they're fine. So I'll let it go. It's good. And, and were you able to really let it go? Yes. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Hooray. Yeah. The thought I had was somewhat of a, a complaint. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I had trouble letting go of it. I couldn't get the car to move on. <laughs> <laughs> it was stuck in the middle of the road. Kind of stuck. It, it left eventually, but. <laughs> well, and, and they do leave eventually, right? I mean, they do leave. And so when you say you were trying to push it down the road, uh, talk more about that or. What does that feel I like? was just trying to visualize it leaving and it just didn't want to go. <laughs> Not quite yet. Yeah, some of them are very stubborn, huh? They're very stubborn. So well, it's an old complaint. So one <laughs> of your top Nothing ten. new. <laughs> Do you recognize well, the most one of your top ten, Carolyn? Actually, I don't think it is the top 10. It just is something that's coming up this week and, mm. and it's this complaint attached to it. And anyway. <laughs> yep. That's great. So with, with something like that, should we move it or acknowledge it or both? Um, okay, that's a good question. My first thought is that acknowledging it seeing it, looking at it, and then it kind of moves on its own. As Carolyn said, you know, I was trying to, because the more we effort at it, you know, uh, that's not always as helpful. But if we can see it, right, turn the attention towards the light, the light towards the cloud, then it will dissipate. Some clouds take longer than others. Some cars get stuck on the road longer than others, but that's okay. And so we just continue to, ah, I see you complaining, uh, you know, resisting. And we can name it, just continue to name it. Maybe think of another name for it. And the more attention we give it and name it, then hopefully it dissipates. Or that's the practice anyway. So yeah, that would be my thought on that. Anyone else have from their experience um i do yeah yeah okay so these last two weeks i've been dealing with this um series of rabies shots because i got bit by a bat and uh it's made me really sick it's it's uh it's, it's that in me that has uh it's it's poison and i have had a really hard time with letting it be there and asking it to get the fuck out. <laughs> um, I definitely, definitely found more this week than the first week, but the, this, this week have been, oh, this is giving me an opportunity to use my tools of meditation. And I am so grateful to you for what you've given me and the, 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 now the thing about the thoughts, because when you, when you're sick, when your body is ill, it shuts down and your brain shuts down. Oh, but it doesn't, you want it to, and, but it just spirals. And it has been absolutely, I, that's what I told Amber. I said, oh my God, this is why. I needed this time. I needed this slap on the head because I've always said, you know, if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing, an angel's going to come along and hit you upside the head until you do it right. And I just feel like that's exactly what happened. And I'm so much better in my body and my mind because of what you've given me. And I'm so grateful to you. Well, thank you, Shannon. 
that it's very kind it's it's the i'm just the <laughs> relayer right i'm just the giver of the information i got it but yeah the, but i like i like your giverness well <laughs> um no this is really an important point uh pain injury illness these are all ideas that uh, for our practice, particularly with the body, you know, can I be with this? And these are questions yeah. you can ask as you're in your practice, right? Yeah. How am I feeling? And can I be with this in this moment? And if I can, awesome, I'm going to stay. And if not, then back off a little bit. Yeah. So it's this checking in. Can I be with this? And it's interesting, you know, oftentimes if you just stay, if we just stay in the present, yeah, okay, right now. Acknowledge. Yes, yeah, acknowledge. Yeah. yeah. And then the more attention, so we describe it. It's almost like describing the thoughts, right? Oh, I'm okay. planning, I'm worrying, I'm whatever. So look at the body. Oh, it's a, rather than using the word like pain, can I get more specific? It's a burning, it's a throbbing, it's a, um, you know, uh, whatever it might be, and you start to give it more attention, and give it a little bit of space. And then, you know, I can be, we can be with it a little bit easier. But this is a real challenge of a practice. <laughs> you know, Kathleen, <laughs> yeah. you use the yeah. best practice places, the DMV, the ER, now you're bit by a bat. This is tremendous opportunity. Right. I I have come oh, to oh my God. I have come to I thank you for not letting me die. I do not want to check out with a bat bite. And then I thought, oh wait, maybe I'm supposed to have a bat bite before I check out. You know, I my mind, you know my mind anyway is like nuts. Right. And so we notice the spin. It's yeah. Yeah, but I, I now have become thankful and um, it's a 99% fatal, which got my attention. <laughs> um, rabies. I mean, come on, you know. <sighs> yeah. Anyway, so that's I'm just really grateful to this opportunity that you've given us. Thank you. You know, Shannon. Yes. Talking about pain. <laughs> yes. Um, um, this whole concept was was presented to me back actually 18 years ago when I first got into AA and the 11th step of course is meditation and and I um, as you're aware I've had many joint replacements and on the second joint replacement I was practicing this concept and realizing I had allowed the pain I don't remember if it was a knee or a hip, but to engulf my body. And I thought to myself, wait a minute. I looked at my toes and wiggled my toes and went, my toes don't hurt. So <laughs> I went through each part of my body and brought it back to where, I might've been my knee, to where the pain was. And then I felt better because my mind had allowed the pain to engulf everything instead of just staying at the point that it was. And then I felt better, I, I, you know, it's like, why am I making myself miserable all over? I can just be miserable in my knee. <laughs> it it was was fine. <laughs> <laughs> so I sucked it all back and it was, that's great. It was an eye opening experience, but it worked. So it's, it's a, this whole concept is, has been a blessing for many years. <laughs> yeah, that's great. And I have a brother who can't get out of the negativity of his brain. <laughs> so I've got to stay away from him. <laughs> well, the yeah. waking up, right? It's so yeah. still caught up in the trance. And, you know, yeah. as we all are at different points. Um, but yeah, there is celebration in that. that we did wake up at one point. We may go back to sleep again, you know, but it's this again, it's the practice. Well, something else will come down the road. <laughs> oh, there's always, always something. Always okay. a helper. Yeah. Teachers are everywhere. Um, Angels, you, too. 
<laughs> what you bring up, Susanna, is a really good point in working with pain in the body. Uh, a couple of things. I think I mentioned, or at some point we said, you know, pain is inevitable. Suffering is not. It's like the teaching of the second era, right? There's the event, there's the thing that is causing the pain. And then we put the second arrow in it with our own, like Susanna was saying, she just let her mind let the pain engulf her entire body rather than just the point where it is. So noticing that second arrow when we're putting the suffering on top of the pain. And she's also talking about a really great practice uh, for when we're experiencing pain in the body. And that is that usually it's not the entire body that's in pain. There's some point, my shoulder hurts. Okay, well, and there, are, you know, we just, that's all we can manage is the resistance to our shoulder hurting. So if we start to turn towards that pain, ah, yes, it's burning, it's stuck, it feels hot. But I can find another place in my body that is not in pain. Oh, you know, my hand is happy and relaxed. So when my shoulder becomes too much, I can send my attention towards my hand, be with my hand for a bit and give it some time, give the mind some time to relax and then go back to the shoulder. And you can toggle kind of back and forth with body parts that are in pain and that are not. And so it, it gives you a bit of, you know, respite from all of that. Kara, were you waving it at, at me? Did you? No, I have a fly. <laughs> <laughs> Again, see, you never know what's going on. I, I did want to share something that's been very helpful to me over the last few weeks that you shared in the very first class. Mm -hmm. And that is to liken the brain to other organs like the nose or the ears. And it's really reduced my frustration when I meditate because I would never get frustrated with my nose for smelling something. <laughs> so it's been a really good way to remind myself of, oh, this brain is just a part of my body that's doing its job. And I can identify the thinking and move on with less frustration than before, because I used to get mad like, oh, just stop thinking so much. <clears throat> so that's yeah. been very helpful to me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, that was also a very helpful teaching for me too, Kara, that it really helped uh, to not identify uh, with that so much that I could step outside of all of that, the fire hose, you know, yeah, that was really helpful. Like she says, you know, I wouldn't get mad at my nose for smelling something. So why do I? I love that. That's great, right? So. All right. Well, anyone else have anything they'd like to add or anything? I miss you. <laughs> Sally, dear one, I miss you as well. Those of us who know Sally and adore her, we all miss her. But isn't it nice to be able to see each other yes, yes. Week on a Sunday morning? Yeah. Yes. So, so that's kind of great. When um, series two starts. <laughs> Well, um, actually, I, I was thinking uh, if anybody, you certainly do not have to participate, but if we wanted to kind of move this once we're done here, uh, like next week is the last week of the four week series. Um, but to just have, you know, not a full formal teaching or whatever, but just a little bit of a talk and then we could yes. practice together because it's very helpful Sangha you know, it's the third jewel in Buddhism, Buddha, Dharma, Sangha. You got to have community because as Sally said, first thing she said, I'm, I'm being, it's easier for me to get into the meditation now because we start doing it when you have community and you know that, oh, Sunday morning, I'm going to, it helps us. Uh, spiritual friendship is really important. So just going to put it out there that if you would be interested, we could do that. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll send out a sign up sheet or whatever. Yeah. Um, 
but that was Shannon, weren't we going to do another week because of the week? Yes, we're, we're doing next to... week. Next week is our last week. So hopefully everybody okay. can make it. And uh, yeah, good. that'll be the end of this series. Okay. okay, good. Oh, dear ones, I am so grateful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. Thank you. Sending you all the best, most loving wishes. And uh, I will look forward to seeing you next week. Okay. Yes. Hey. All right. Namaste. Oh, bye, everybody. Namaste. Namaste. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.